Welcome to the Forging Honor Podcast. I'm Jonathan George. And I'm Benjamin Jones. Here at The Forge, we explore what it means to live as Christian men. Along the way, we'll be doing habit-forming challenges to build character through action. We are by no means experts, just two young Christian men trying to make sense of a wild world. That's right. We do our best to learn and hope you'll join us on the journey. And if you want to get directly involved, go to forginghonor.com to find information on how to join our community. This is episode 32, Designing Communication. All right, challenge wrap up time. Uh, the, as a reminder, challenges are regular, simple daily tasks to grow us as men. Uh, the challenges now last last for six weeks. This is a change from how they used to be every two weeks. Um, but now they're six weeks uh, in an attempt to instill them within as a habit, essentially. So the longer we do it, the more habitual it becomes. The current challenge uh, is pretty straightforward, is have a 20 minute conversation with someone every day. Uh, generally another guy, maybe, maybe over a beer or uh, a cigar or a coffee, whatever it is, um, but a 20 minute conversation every day uh, in an effort to kind of grow community. That's our current topic right now. Uh, so Banjo, how have you been doing with this? Uh, this week is, uh, has been pretty good. This, you know, I think I mentioned it last week. The, this one's a lot easier for, for me than, you know, some of our, our other ones have been. I'm mostly extroverted by nature. So a conversation is not typically too difficult for me. I will say this. I was thinking of this challenge today because I went to get a haircut. Uh, and then I went to a barber shop and this was like the first time that I've been to a barber or like, you know, great clips, sports clips, whatever for like, uh, probably a year and a half. My wife has been cutting my hair. So this was the first time going in and there is nothing more difficult to me than trying to have a conversation with someone who is touching my hair. Like, I don't, I don't know the proper way to engage in that form of small talk. And, and I just felt all of the, like the whole time I was like, I'm going to be recording a podcast today about how important conversation is. And this whole time, I just wish that this person would stop talking. Um, but we actually had a, a really nice conversation. I learned a lot about the town and uh, he had a lot of questions about um, like Christianity and religion. And he's like, what, you know, what's up with that kind of a deal? And so I actually got to like share the gospel in a barber chair and that's, you know, conversations at work, I guess. So yeah, it's been, uh, it's been some good conversations this week. How about, how about you, JJ? That's really cool. Um... That's cool that you were finding opportunities to have conversations and even share the gospel um, uh, it, without necessarily planning those conversations. Um, so for me, I've if 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 I'm measuring, um, I've actually missed several days. So I'm probably in the in ninety percent as far as our we're, we're four weeks in on this. So I've missed several days out of those four weeks. And one thing I've noticed about that is, I, if I'm staying home. I tend just yeah you know, get involved in my work or maybe I'm watching something with my wife you know whatever it is um, I'm not making any intentional effort to have a conversation when I'm out and about I can definitely do that I am conversational but I realize if if I don't have something to take me out of the house then there is very little motivation for me to even pick up the phone and call someone I need to be out of the house um, so when it comes to being in community that's that's kind of been a takeaway for me so far it's just being being present in that community not isolating myself. Yeah. So. I bet Connor will have stuff to say about that when we talk about third spaces and, and that kind of a thing. Speaking of time to intro our guest today. So today we are joined by Connor Neville, who is a Christian husband, father of three and missional entrepreneur. Connor has launched several businesses and is the principal founder of Ecclesia Design, which serves to exhort and equip the saints to take dominion over the place where God has called them through landscape architecture and redemptive localism. Connor enjoys a good chat with just about anyone, as he loves apologetics, evangelism, and engaging conversation. Welcome. We, we've got Connor here. Well, hello. Thank you for having me. I'm very grateful to join this conversation today. I know it's a, it's a stage conversation, so I don't know if it qualifies for our 20-minute <laughs> conversation. <laughs> well, yes, right, just read, read the dialogue on the script that we gave you, and, and you'll be fine. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, yeah. If you're a if you're a predestinarian and a you know, if you hold the, <laughs> everything is sovereignly appointed. Everyone is uh, a scripted conversation. No. <laughs> this is going to well, go really well. I'm going to like this. We're, we're way off track already. All right. Is this, I, <laughs> I kid. I kid. All right. Uh, so as you heard us talk about, we're in the middle of um, our, our current challenge being 20 minute conversations. Um, one of our goals, like I said, is to explore the topic of community. So to start out, kind of give us a little bit more than the intro that that I read off here, 
Uh, what interests you in, about community? Um, what interests you in specifically conversation and how does that influence community? So just a broad jump into the topic. Excellent. Well, that is a very broad jump. Let's see. I think community is uh, the social structure of our everyday lives. Um, you can define it at different scales, and I think that's interesting. You have a community within your own home and uh, different people, depending on your family structure, unless you live by yourself. Um, but you, you exist within a network of other people. I think our individualism today is something that, as a cultural moment, we struggle to relate with one another as, as people in the past of different eras used to, um, where they used to view themselves as part of a greater whole. And I think um, being a Christian podcast, the concept of body life and um, being a part of the body of Christ and being a part of the Christian community that um, binds people together, we, we relate with, with one another in a lot of different ways that um, requires us to use words. It's not, we don't just, you know, point and grunt. Uh, we have to have conversations with each other. And um, I think within community, being able to know how to talk with one another and communicate, just like our body has a nervous system that communicates from the brain down to the hands and, um, you know, the stomach tells you that you're hungry and uh, you respond in kind. We need to tell each other our needs and um, tell each other our, our uh, joys and things that we are able to rejoice together and to weep together and I think a lot of that has to do with conversation within the, the church body, but more largely, I think, from my interest and kind of a, a springboard springboard off of the introduction, I'm really big into, it's, you said, redemptive localism. So urban planning, development, uh, planning, and design. It's an uh, industry that a lot of people don't understand when you hear landscape architecture, but it really is designing the places for people. So your favorite places where you hang out, plazas, uh, streetscapes, Things that when you think about, oh, I want to go be there, even in nature, typically it's, um, you know, a scenic overlook where the bench and the trail is, is very specifically designed. Um, that's something that we can, I'm sure, dive into, but I'm fond of going to etymology of words. And I'll just, I'll stop on the etymology of the title of this episode is designing communication. And design comes from the Latin designari, which means to decide. So really everything that we say, every word that we choose we have to decide what we say. We have to decide the community that we engage with, how to engage it. So there's a lot of design in the landscape architecture profession and community development. And in the same way, there's a lot of design when it comes to how we communicate with one another. I think that's cool, The how you're recognizing the intermingling of the design of our physical world around us, but also those those not physical, not so physical connections that we have with each other. Um, so one of the reasons I was excited to have you on uh, was because you recognize that design and you recognize why that park bench might be in a specific spot. Uh, so one of the questions that I had specifically was if you were going to design a conversation that just between two people, right? We're having these 20 minute conversations. If you were to design a conversation, uh, where would that park bench be? You know, what would be those, what, if you were to break it down, what would be the specific things to start with? so that you could then you know, build something around that? Um, so designing a conversation, and I guess just to clarify, are you saying conversation about where a park bench would go? or? Oh, no, no. <laughs> like if you were to um, know that like in, in this um, this idea, the park bench itself is it's just an idea. Like it's uh, okay. like if you were to design the, in the conversation, there might be a beginning, a middle, and an end to the conversation, right? Where Where does that go, right? So conversation broadly... Um, to converse with one another and to to be uh, essentially with synchrony. Like, what is good conversation? What would a, a well-designed thing be? And what is anything that's good? I think I'd maybe just take it back to the root of um, what is the end goal? What's the, the telos of a good conversation? How do we get to uh, an ideal, ideally designed conversation? And it's good insofar as it relates to uh, the created order that, around us. So um, something that is good, speaks to the human nature, it speaks to the um, experience that we all can collectively share, and you, that resonates with one another, that that kind of harkens to the, the root of what conversing means, like we, we're together, we're with one another in, in what we're talking about. And so I think ultimately building upon um, a shared experience or a shared topic, you're, you're conversing about one thing 
and you build on it um, is if I were to design it, I think you'd start with a topic that is a prompt, and then from there you can um, you can lay a foundation and then architecturally build structure to that. And we kind of enter conversations with fits and starts, and we trial and error different materials. If we're thinking about building, switching the metaphor, <laughs> running a little wild with it, if you're thinking about building a cathedral, um, the thought of how it gets built, what is the end goal, what is the best way it could be designed. Um, I think in, in the similar sense, our conversations ultimately are to glorify God, just like a, a church building would be just like, you know, a, a really good coffee at, a, at the local coffee shop or anything that you would point to that's really good. Um, ultimately, it glorifies God. That's the chief end of man. And um, I think in that sense, our conversations ought to start with something that we can then approach that end goal with and um, the beginning middle and end you'd start with a topic the middle is you'd kind of iterate back and forth a few things maybe it comes in the form of conversational debate maybe it comes in the form of conversational agreement like yes that's exactly what I mean and and that reminds me of this piece and you build on one another's thoughts and similar to what we're doing here and then um, it, the end is something where you just kind of relish in the the shared idea that you've both benefited from or that collectively you've benefited from by having that conversation it's it's what satisfaction you get at the end of a symphony a well-composed orchestra um, where everything resonates there's crescendos there's you know pianissimo where it, it, it dies down and then at the very end the, the last cymbal clash and then it all stops you just want to clap you know i think an ideal conversation is wow i i got so much added value out of that and that's what a lot of podcasters like yourselves are trying to do these days there's that 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 resonant note, like we want to we want to strike a chord with another person, uh, and I like I I love the imagery that you you have. It's probably just probably just ingrained into you now of, of this building up of a community and, and of constructing. And I think that's really useful language verbiage because um, as I was thinking about it today, you know I enjoy listening to you know a variety of podcasts, and I I was thinking about the podcasts I really enjoy listening to that are for entertainment value as opposed to like uh, you know learning something. I I love a podcast where people have an argument, you know, where they debate trivialities and and you know they argue back and forth about about movies and that kind of stuff. Um, but it occurred to me that you know we've we've gotten into a cycle of our our conversations are designed for our entertainment and are really combative. Um, I see this a lot with my students where a, a conversation doesn't, there's no, in, in a middle school lunchroom, there's not exactly an exchange of ideas taking place. It's not exactly like the commonplace of a lot, you know, the, the marketplace of philosophy. It's, it's more just kind of like, you know, insult comics working their chops, you know, and, um, you know, young comedians getting their starts, which is all well and good. But I, I wanted to ask, you know, how do we design conversation? What would it look like to design a space for conversation that is constructive rather than destructive? In other words, how do we how do we build our conversations with one another um, in order to build one another up and not just amuse ourselves and you know stage prize fights you know in the hallways? That's great. Um, I think. Heard in the question, and I, I tend to want to think about what does it look like, you know, and trying to physically create those those spaces for those conversations. I don't know if that's specifically the the question at hand. Like, what would it be to create inspiring ambient or ambient atmospheres within a, a shared space or a own space or a third space? And we can talk about that concept too. I'm sure. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the the thought of like where where can social form take place and thrive and flourish how do we create human flourishing in the form of conversation um, and I'm, I'm a big fan i think uh, churchill has famously said that we shape our architecture and our architecture then in turn shapes us so um, the places that we make and design are influential i don't i'm not i started the <laughs> the introductory statement of um, predeterminism but i don't i'm not a um determinist in the fatalistic sense where like everything is just absolutely like you design it and then that will shape conversation to a very specific end like people are organic they're going to do a lot of different um, unpredictable things in a, a space that you have a very intentional goal for so 
Um, all that to say, as best as we can try and build in our communities, as best as we can try and um, design platforms or even podcasts like virtual spaces, and where we we know that when we frequent a, a particular podcast set of co-hosts, like we know that they're going to arrive at a conclusion that we enjoy and it's a productive conversation. Fostering that's an important thing to try and aim for, for sure. Um, and so maybe just um, not in a physical sense, but taking your question in a, a more, I hate to say like a digital or a, an abstract sense, I think uh, how do we create something that's constructive? I, I said the word earlier, just thinking about inspiring. I think that's one of the main goals of people today having a conversation that clicks and it's something that it's something that has a handhold and it's a tool or a weapon in your hand that you can now use it's something that we always use this phrase add value i think the more that we can uh, equip people that's one of the taglines of pleasy design is uh, to exhort and equip the saints the more that we're equipping people with our words and with our conversation, the better. And I think really it's a matter of finding out what your interlocutor in a debate or what your conversation partner is uh, is needing. And that comes by questions. You know, it's, you know, well, where are you at today? Like, what, you know, how are you doing with your spouse? You know, what, that's how you strike up conversation where you meet the person where they're at. And I think really that's the first step is to lay a foundation of, uh, what is our topic for conversation today? If you bump into somebody at, at a store or at a barbershop or wherever, it's it's meeting them where they're at and then building from there. That's a gr- that's a great little, you know, JJ is always the one looking for practical stuff, but I'm going to latch onto it this time. Um, that that little um, that little thing of of asking a question and listening and and doing doing the doing the host thing you know, um, even if, even if you're not the host of the situation, but doing the, the hostly thing of, of laying the foundation and saying, okay, this is your space where we can build something together. I'm, I'm going to, um, open the floor. I find in so many conversations that are unpleasant, it begins with somebody else telling me something that I didn't ask, you know? And, um, I think it's, it's just one of those little things where, uh, when you when you start a conversation by just invading somebody's space with with information, it's so so different from from inviting someone into to express themselves and to and to say what they have to say. And now I'm doing the same thing by you know talking over our uh, over our yes, but I'm going to switch it. JJ, do you have anything to build on with this one? Well, there goes the building analogy, just just stepping stones to that cathedral, I guess. I learned fast. Uh, well, one thing that stuck out, and this is this is a uh, um, maybe maybe it is more practical because uh, Banjo's right. Uh, we I like to go for some of the practical things, but one thing that stuck out, you know, you had the those hooks for the conversations, you know, asking those questions to open up the space, uh, and that sounds dreadfully like small talk, which everybody. That's this thing that we all like to hate on. We all say we we hate small talk. Why can't we just get to the meat of a conversation? Uh, but it sounds like you're advocating for a form of small talk. What does that look like practically? Uh, you know, if you were to do that well, and it's something we've we've had a few conversations before, and it's something that has stuck out to me. You, you are good at those hooks. Uh, is there something in your mind that that you're thinking when you do that? Like, what are you what are you going for there? That's great. Um, the First thing that comes to mind, and I, I don't know if y'all listen to uh, the Kings Hall, the group that has, they're out of Refuge Church from Ogden, Utah, and they have a great set of podcasts. I'm, I don't mean to just give them a unsolicited plug here, but um, they did talk. About, hey, no worries. If they're good, they're good. Yeah, they're, they're good. And um, But they, they had an episode at one point, um, I think it was on the Hardman podcast, on um, basically like awkward men and just what it means to be a Christian man and being able to speak well is one of the things being able to read well, speak well, um, work well, love well, and um, ultimately serve the Lord well. But um, being able to speak well with one another is something that I think your question could, uh, Jonathan, JJ could take two forms. Um, It's if you know someone, it's about paying attention to things and then remembering uh, a good follow-up. Like I know to check about your kids or I know to ask about how your wife's doing with, pregnancy and like knowing certain 
prodding questions where it's like, oh, well, I know that there's something about him or I heard something about you recently. So if you know something, then following up on that is a great in and people want to be able to um, have an opportunity to share something that's going on in their life. Um, if you don't know and it's a uh, first encounter, first impression, um, if it's a man speaking to a woman and you know he's in a potential circumstance to be able to court them and it's like you kind of have to win the girl like if, if it's actually like a hook in that sense that's a whole different you know set of tactics and game and what it means to um to woo and to uh, gain someone's interest but i think just man to man from the introduction of what we're trying to arrive at here how do you constructively have a conversation that is led in with small talk small talk is um it ought to be interesting. And so if you, I've heard it said, um, you know, interested people are interesting people. So people who are interested in lots of things or people who are interested in everything around them, uh, everything that God has made and just being able to see glory and discover what glories have been hidden. If you're interested in most things, then that's kind of, I mean, that's probably my personality type is I, I'm interested, you know, tell me about it. I think that's kind of the disposition to maintain. So I'd, I'd land the plane there. Absolutely. I've definitely heard that before, you know, the be interested, not inter interesting, which in turn leads to being interesting. Um, and there's something there. People love to have questions asked of them that are real questions. You know, I, I think the thing, what I've noticed about myself that I hate w when it comes to small talk, you know, is the, oh, the weather is doing this today. Like that doesn't add anything to anyone. You're not learning about anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, like, like you were saying, there's definitely, if you're interested in what the other person has to say, that's a different type of small talk, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. And I've always, I mean, if, especially having little factoids that you could, fun facts and, you know, being a dad and having dad jokes or whatever, but being able to kind of derail the, the typical mundane, um, banal, like the conversations about weather. It's like, where is this, you know, um, what would you do on a on a rainy day? Like if it, it like ah oh, rain. It's like what are your favorite rainy day activities? Or like I don't know. Being able to say, did you know that uh, the weather forecast, the percent chance of rain? Do you know what it means by percentage? And just like see if they have any kind of intrigue into what meteorology and how the science and and satellites and stuff. Like being interested. I think that's part of it, and it's fun to have those prompts. But um, it is something that. Uh, Small talk is a bridge and it's relational currency. And I think that's the, the main way to view it is um, it allows you in. And like you said, Banjo, being able to um, be invited to speak, it, it kind of it builds the bridge to likewise be asked things about yourself. And then ideally, you're trying to showcase the uh, 1 Peter 3.15, the charter verse for apologetics. And, and apologetics are intertwined with evangelism. Being able to... Um, always be ready to give a uh, reason defense for the hope that's within you and being able to answer any man that asks of you. So there's an asked portion of that verse to be able to see that uh, people ought to see how joyful you are, see how hopeful you are on certain topics, see why even on a rainy day, you can have, you know, a sunshiny face. Um, they ought to say like, wow, you're so, what makes you so joyful? Like, boom, there it is. So um, those types of things are just a joy to, see the, the fruit at the end of the, the branch and just know that uh, it might take a little watering, but it's conversation is the way to get there for sure. It's a patient thing. I like that. Um, that model of always, you know, that always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you is it's so different from what I see just like in general around me where most, most conversations seem to begin with, wow, like, everything's terrible. Like, oh, I hate that guy. You know, that's just seems like the, the largest uh, foundation for most of our social interaction right now, it seems to be hate, you know, oh, you and I hate the same thing. Great. We can have a conversation. Um, it's, it's probably not super helpful for building relationships. So I like that hope model. Um, I'm wondering if you can, you can help me. Uh, how should I say? Un undo some of my sinful tendencies, I think. So I have this, one of my favorite movies is a, is a, um, is it, let's just call it a, uh, a very not Christian movie called Glen Gary, Glenn Ross. It's one of my favorite movies and it's all about people having conversations. It's a, it's a, a real estate movie. I love it. Um, 
but one of one of the best lines in the movie to me is is uh, Al Pacino uh, says to Kevin Spacey after Kevin Spacey has ruined uh, this this business deal that Al Pacino is trying to make. Al Pacino says to him, "You never open your mouth till you know what the shot is." And I've always loved that line because I've always thought it was it's great advice. You know, and I, I think I saw the movie when I was 18 or something like that. So, you know, everything you see on TV when you're 18 is great advice. Um, but but that particular line has, has stuck with me. And I, I've noticed recently that I'm much more defensive in conversations. I'm much more uh, stoic. I'm much more uh, cagey. I think because in part of that line of that philosophy that I've adopted and from what you're saying, I, I'm thinking, well, hold on, maybe I'm not doing my my job of inviting and and being willing to make some of those mistakes that happen in conversation and vulnerability. Um, is, do, what do you think? Is that is that an attitude? I know it's an attitude a lot of men adopt. Is it something that we should be wary of or is there reason to be careful? That's good. Well, you said KG and it makes me think of like, cage stage Calvinism. I don't know if that's a familiar term for the listenership or for both of you as well, but unpack it. Yeah. Well, I mean, especially, um, I don't know, Bancho, just meeting you today too, but I know where Jonathan and I uh, go to church, being able to see the reformed theology and Calvinistic understanding of the faith and, um, being Presbyterians, Westminster, uh, confession of faith, like being able to have an understanding of the doctrines of grace, it really kind of puts a seed into our hearts, rightfully so, that has us resent the sinfulness of man and recognize like it's it's all by the grace of God we're totally depraved. And I think you then look with a jaded eye at your brother, uh, you know, or somebody not within the body of faith even. Um, I think cage stage Calvinism, that's it just it, it's catchy. Um, as soon as you, somebody becomes a Calvinist, typically there's a season of life where they just want to like beat all of their family and friends and loved ones and people that even they know are solid Christians over the head with the club of like, no, but you're wrong. It's, it's all by grace through faith. Like it, it clicks in a way that they just get frustrated where, um, other people don't see things in truth and in, in the glory of the truth, but it's just, it's it's a frustrating moment. And I think I'm likewise to your point, I'm frustrated with even just um, coworkers, uh, unbelievers, anyone that seems like they are just wanting to be doom and gloom or want to um, just share the, the trash of this world and all the garbage on social media, like share it around and just point to things that are so ugly instead of, and, and destructive and breaking down instead of building up. Um, I think that, can elicit a sense of like resentment, just seething um, frustration where it's like, just stop, you know, like I just, I want to be cynical back or something. So completely understand what you're saying. I'm, I'm likewise tempted, but um, I do think it is a very healthy antidote to uh, all the darkness around us when we come forward with light and when we walk as children of the light and, we can see things with the eye of faith and not by sight, and we can have a hope for the future instead of um, being just ruled by despair. I think all of those kinds of scriptural motifs and, and words are something to just let it wash over our own cynical, you know, cage stage heart. <laughs> but um, also, I think the way out of the cage is typically being able to give the same amount of grace to others that you're trying to preach, like, <laughs> and. Um, so giving others grace and giving them conversational grace, and often that can look like giving them conversational rope to, and it's an awful expression, but give them enough rope to hang themselves with where it's like you catch them in something that they say that you want to just turn back and show a mirror to it. Like, really, what do you, so I just heard you say this, like, is that something that, you know, let me, let me press in on that. Or since we're probably all millennials here, like, let me double click on that real quick. Um, so <laughs> um, just being able to press the antithesis that's a great book by greg bonson um, about apologetics and just how to talk with somebody talk with an unbeliever but um, pressing the antithesis like it, everything is dark let's be light you know everything is uh, dismal let's be 
optimistic and, and victorious, right? Sort of a clickbait conversationalism. Yeah, then. that's right. And there, I mean, it it almost yeah, the clickbait like they're almost inviting you by by nature of the joyfulness to then say, "What's your reason for the hope that's within you?" Do you is your sense that um, to or I guess to what degree do you do you feel that every conversation ends with it, should every conversation end with an apologetic gesture? Is uh, is every conversation is you know is it like a Bible passage? Does does every conversation need to you know explicitly or implicitly point back to Christ? Yeah, how do we? I was I was thinking about this in the barber's chair today. I was like I you know I I want to you know meet this guy where he's at. I you know I don't want to be um, I, I you know I want to share the gospel and I want to you know, give the truth here, but I don't want to do it in a way that's, um, you know, no offense, but the gospel, uh, kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, so to what extent do you feel that needs to be, you know, I, yeah, the center, I won't, I won't qualify the question. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. And it, it's obviously taking the, what we've arrived at so far to its logical, logical conclusion. Like, is this is that what it always is about? And, and so I think the ideal, back to the original question a little while back, the ideal conversation, if we were to design a conversation, it would have that end goal. But I think as the reformers would um, have us understand, truth, beauty, and goodness are something that we ought to just strive for in all of our communication. Let your words be wholesome and uh, edifying and for the building up. So it would be quite the awkward and really for, like frustrating to our spouse and kids. It would be quite the awkward dinner table uh, person to be sitting at the head of the table and just constantly trying to have apologetics and evangelism be the the end of your conversation always. I think to a barber, to a grocery store clerk, to a coworker, being able to just point to something that's true and land on the fact that it's true. I think that's seldomly uh, understood in this world, but it's palpable. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Like you know that there's truth in what's being spoken with a, a sense of Christian confidence. And I think that's palpable. Um, goodness, you know, like there's so such good beauty and, and glory to be able to point to. And that's a good end of the conversation to be striving towards. Um, and so I just said beauty, but uh, truth, goodness, and beauty, like being able to just point to those things is a good kind of rule of thumb uh, that I tried, I, maybe implicitly. This is an interesting line of questions that I don't know that I've, you know, verbalized my thoughts on it before, but um, I think that's really important to try and have our speech be seasoned with salt um, and be a, a wise word at a timely moment. It's better than, you know, is it an apple and a setting of silver? So I think those kinds of um, ends are what we ought to be striving for with the means of conversation. But um, beyond that, I think... Um, Showing people those doors are what bring people into an encounter with um, the Lord and being able to see that, like, I know some people whose apologetic methodology is leading with beauty. It's beauty, goodness, truth. Like, it, so I think you can come at it a lot of different ways, but ultimately we've kind of just sat on this uh, topic for a minute and that's what we're discussing in terms of apologetics and evangelism. But um, Building one another up in our skills, in our trades, um, in our craft competencies, in our um, what we do by our character, and what y'all do on this podcast that I've greatly benefited from. What it means to you know forge honor in another man and just build up character traits. That's a, a noble goal of a conversation as well, and I think that's ultimately what we're talking about. That's awesome. I. I... I like your, the, the idea or the, the, that image of the guy sitting at the head of his table and just annoying all his kids being like, yes, but, but evangelism, and yes, but the gospel. I've been um, in those conversations. I mean, not at my, my, my table, but I've, you know, I've been to people's houses and, you know, different places and it, and that's the conversation. And you're like, something is lost in the humanity when, when, right. you know, we don't get to see each other in an, an actual human life. Sorry, JJ, I cut in. No, 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 I just, I found it funny. But at the same time, I, I appreciate your response to that, Connor, and that um, just highlighting the truth, beauty, and goodness, and how that is something we should be seeking in every conversation. Um, 
and and I'll admit that's difficult for me sometimes. I I sometimes fall in the category of the cynic of the well, this terrible thing happened today, when you know, I'll listen to this terrible thing that happened to you today. Oh, <laughs> aren't our lives terrible? Um, but I don't feel like that's a, that's a a constructive conversation necessarily, and I don't think that 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 fills a community well. Uh, which kind of pulling back a little bit now in our in our in our conversation here. We've talked a little bit about what the building blocks of conversation, the goals of conversation, um, at least in the in the short term. But in the long term, um, you know, if we're if we're trying to build that community, and that's something I know that you are you are passionate about, uh, is as you put it, redemptive localism. Which I, I hadn't heard that phrase before, and I think that's really an interesting phrase. I'd love to know more about. Like, did you come up with that? Where'd that come from? But redemptive localism, um, looking at how can we, how can we have these conversations, and what, where do these conversations start that help to build that? Wow. Well, it's a big topic. It's a um, phenomenon that I don't know that I've heard that exp- those two words right next to each other before necessarily. Um, there's redemptive placemaking is a is a colleague that is in the same kind of line of work um, that there's a workbook that you can walk through as a church and think about redemptive placemaking that that's something that is spoken of on podcasts a a couple different places um but placemaking is kind of the simplified version of of what it means to be a a landscape designer or landscape architect um it's like a non-credentialed it doesn't have a a professional stamp that then gets reviewed and approved by municipalities to then go build something it's more of placemaking's like art installations and and uses of different space. Like what I do in my backyard with <laughs> meager attempts at a garden. Yeah, well, and it's <laughs> it's good. I mean, it, I'm not trying to belittle it. I'm just trying to scale where it falls and um, within a profession, ultimately, I think, and a skill right. set. That's kind of what I'm um, appealing to with the difference of category there. But redemptive localism. And so Ecclesia Design um, has the tagline, local churches redeeming places. And the, the root, the etymology of redeem means to buy back. Um, it, it literally is something we're redeemed by you know, the blood of Christ. We were captive by the uh, debt and wages of our sin, which is death. And he bought us back. He were, we were covered in the blood of Christ. We were bought with a price. Um, uh, so I think that kind of image of what it means to redeem a place and redeem a community, redemptive localism to redeem a locality, it really does, uh, point to the fact that there's a community that lives in every place. Like there's barren wastelands that are uninhabited, but ultimately there's a community that has probably settled in um, most places, or at least wherever the listenership, like you're a person in a place like that. So um, there's a community around anyone, wherever you are. So um, viewing yourself as part of a community and then viewing that community as being the object of redemption. So Christ is bringing all of his enemies under his feet. He's uh, the the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. The the kingdom of, of heaven will advance on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Like it'll advance on earth as a seed to a large tree, as uh, leaven in a lump of dough. And he's, um, as Colossians says, uh, reconciling all things to himself. He's redeeming all things. And so there's some positive victorious theology just to inspire the work of redemptive localism. And so buying back literally places like buildings on your main street where that uh, shop and, and leasable area or purchasable tenant space is. Um, buying back different institutions that have, you know, whether it's they've, they've gone into a a completely different political territory that you um, want to be able to just redeem it for good, positive work for advancing the kingdom or for your own business or for your own family or whatever it might look like, being able to buy back places. Um, There's a financial element, obviously, by saying buying it. um, But I think conversation is a huge part of this, too, because every decision that's made about your local place is at this point, given uh, the state of affairs, has become uh, hierarchicalized to like the local government. So <laughs> everything gets run through the gatekeepers of your uh, local city council or your 
county commissioners or your um, BOMA, your alderman and, and mayor. And so those local meetings, those planning commission meetings, those are active ways that you can participate in your community. And those are conversations. Like they're not, um, they don't have tools out, you know, in those meetings and not, they're not building anything with their hands or with a trade or a skill. It's literally, they have microphones and you can come up as a public speaker and speak into a microphone. And that's a recorded conversation, but it is a conversation nevertheless. So being able to have persuasive rhetoric and being able to um, influence your local leaders and being able to even have meetings on the side in third spaces and meeting places where you can bend their ear to your will, um, understanding that communities operate under the influence of its constituents is a huge um, undergirding aspect to what it means to redeem places and to have redemptive localism. So those were a lot of technical terms and there's some you know bigger jargon and all that, but I think um, to have uh, a people and then in particular local churches, so the Christians that are gathering in a place, um, to have them exercise dominion and and subdue and to fill and multiply and to actually steward the resources around them. To have that actually work, it requires um, them joining the conversation, having a seat at the table, having their voice be heard, having it be known and having it influence and actually affect change. And I think ultimately putting into practice all of what we've discussed so far. Uh, Connor, is, is, does this have any, well, let me rephrase the question. Um, what connection, or does this have uh, the idea of redemptive localism? Is this connected at all to to Wendell Berry? Do you, do you have any uh, roots with him? Could you talk about that? If so, that's great. Yeah, well, he's uh, an interesting character as an individual, but I think his ideologies resonate with the concept of localism in a lot of people's minds. He's kind of one of the um, our generation's uh, main prolific voices that a lot of people point to. And he has some pretty um, beautiful prose when he discusses kind of the agrarian, bucolic, uh, slower way of life and living. Um, he's often referenced in circles like the Front Porch Republic, which is another podcast, The Brass Platoon, and they host conferences. And it's a it's an article generating, um, I guess, publishing house, but it's like a, an, a group, it's an organization that publishes and um, you can read different things and listen to different lectures. So, um, yeah, Wendell Berry embodies and kind of is the um, exemplar of, um, in a sense, caring about your local place. But I think he doesn't necessarily capture the body life of all different types of places. I think he, he really advocates for um, the more bucolic, slower way of life, which doesn't really land with urban urbanophiles, you know, people who are in cities and stuff. So, um, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed his stuff for sure. But redemptive localism would be, it's not, it's not just about a, an agricultural mindset or going back to land necessarily. It's more like how do, how do we, uh, if I can use the word, manipulate the space around us to be most edifying to yeah. community? Absolutely. Okay. Well, and all of it, I mean, all places, every square inch, as Abraham Kuyper has famously said, every square inch is Christ. So um, viewing even the suburb even the you know small town even the big city as um, every square inch being able to be redeemed so um, it's kind of like we talked about earlier in in just having a conversation with somebody being interested and seeing the hidden glories that you know it's the the glory of god to conceal a matter it's the glory of kings to search it out and being able to see that street corner that building that skyscraper that you know, farm field and just see its future potential. That's what a landscape architect does. I think that's what God called Adam to do is to fill the earth and to subdue it and to take dominion over it. Like we talked about, I, I actually was listening recently. Um, I was texting JJ about um, episode 16. So a while back, God's natural creation. Um, and in that you're saying like it to take dominion doesn't mean that like you go into wilderness and you clear cut it all and then you plant even rows. Of course not. But what it means to steward a forest is knowing good silvicultural techniques of like how to selectively thin a forest stand. If it's an oak hickory forest, you want to understand what's invasive and how to best, you know, cause the, the local ecology to flourish. Taking dominion means, you know, being lords 
over that land. And so what does it mean for a Christian church or, you know, an operational Christian business or a family and um, wherever they find themselves to be lords over their land? So I think that's kind of the goal is wherever you are. I like that word ecology that you use because it makes me think what we're what we're doing in conversation in, in, in terms of, you know, JJ is the practical guy. I'm the bigger picture guy. Uh, not, not 100% of the time. No, not 100% of the time. <laughs> I'm the daydreamer though. You're the, you're like, okay, let's actually do it. Um, but as, as the daydreamer, think about like the ecology of, of conversation, you know, when we're talking to one another, you know, I think we're recognizing one, one of the things that's, that keeps coming up is like our choices, our decisions. What we're talking about is, is individual agency. Like conversation is a place where individual agency is on display. And what we hate about, you know, someone who, who hogs the microphone, pardon the pun, dear listener, is that uh, they're, they're taking over everyone's agency. They're, they're the one who's taking it. And they're like that tree in the forest that takes all the sunlight and kills all the little trees. And in being excellent conversationalists, which as I think about it is, is one of those like marks of a virtuous man that we've seen in history from, you know, Alexander Pope and, and, and the Italian, you know, the whole the Italian Renaissance, the whole thing. We've always valued that virtue of being able to have a conversation because a, a good conversationalist enriches the ecology of the place around him. It, it, it makes a better ecosystem and, and brings new ideas to light. To that end, I was going to ask, could you explain to our listeners who might not know, what is a third space? Why don't we have them and, and why do we need them? We've thrown that out several times now, and I've I've I saw some article. I'm not 100 percent sure I know what a third space is. So, talk talk to me. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I know um, you have your home and your work. I think is where you spend the majority of your day to day and the majority of your life, especially as a, a man. Um, if you're not a you know stay at home mom and whatever the calling that you have is, I mean, a lot of the people then probably have something like, you know, a church and, you know, Wednesday night fellowship meals or you go there for your Bible studies or whatever. So, like, often that's your third space, right? You have your home, your office, and then where else do you spend time, right? So if you're going to go out, where is your favorite place that's not your house or your office to go? And so those third spaces, most people um, would probably, would pose when posed the question would say like a park or um, a plaza or like a mixed use to um, mixed use commercial district where there's a lot of shops or like a mall, I guess is kind of um, one form of that, um, which historically were, were church squares where they was lined with the different artisans and the different people, but, um, or like the, the Agora or the, you know, the forum and what it meant to actually have a, a, a public square. Um, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people have viewed the digital public square of X or Instagram as their third space. So if they just view their escape, they view their favorite place to hang out is online. Okay, so that's an interesting obstacle that we're up against when we're talking about this as a, you know, as a topic. Third spaces have been usurped by the digital place. Um, and ultimately, I think creating places for people to love and to hang out and to flourish and to enjoy. Um, that's the goal of a landscape architect is to create beautiful places. So uh, that's obviously forefront of my mind often, but um, the thought of a third space is something that um, there's a whole, like in the history of, of land planning, landscape architecture, going through that course in schooling, there was a whole series of, study elements or study curriculum moments of um, what it meant for like palaces for the people or public parks like historically it was it was not something that was readily available to most of the peasants within a kingdom and there was nobility and clergy and there weren't really public lands in a sense there were crown rights and and royal lands that you shouldn't probably go on and stuff um, so it's interesting in that sense to create public places that your physical forms influence your social forms and then your social forms influence your spiritual forms. So I think being able to um, 
work backwards in that kind of telescoping um, degree of of like concrete practical um, our physical forms around us are something that we ought to be particularly interested in as Christians because we um, that's where our society meshes that's where you rub shoulders with people that are in different social strata and classes that's where you um, have conversations with people that could change your life that's where you have conversations with people that you could change their lives so um, third spaces are, are great to be out and about in community and to join the greater conversation so to speak um, and then even online I think there's not it shouldn't be disparaged that there's meaningfulness to um, contributing to the greater conversation on any given topic by adding your voice like you just said um, contributing to it What do you think, JJ? You got it now? Third space? Do we have third space? It, it makes sense. Uh, I, there's some irony here, I feel like, in that we, you know, this is an online third space. Mm -hmm. this, yes. We're a little bit – That's podcasts have kind of become that. They definitely have, I, and I, I definitely could have put that together if I'd gone and looked up an article or something. Um, <laughs> it's just never – it's never – that's never been like a, a thing on my mind, like, oh, I need a third space. And you, everything you mentioned, you know, I probably have like a seventh or an eighth space, like in terms of the number of places I, I spend most of my life. Mm -hmm. um, but that's interesting. I wonder how many people don't even have, like aside from the online, if you count the online third space, um, and that's a lot of people's third spaces. But I've wondered how many people are are removing themselves from these physical third spaces, whether intentionally or not, because... Um, you know, something like we had the we had the big COVID back in 2020. And I think that it removed a lot of people's third spaces. Um, or they stopped attending the third space, going to the third space, whatever that was, and they just never went back. Um, I, and I've wondered in the long run, how is that going to affect us? I haven't thought about it in those terms, third space. Um, but it's just in terms of, of social interaction. Um, we've seen it in, in the church, you know, people that were only sort of attending stopped attending altogether uh and and that's been an interesting an interesting thing to watch absolutely well and there's a book by eric o jacobson who's big into um, new urbanism as a concept but from the christian faith he, he's written sidewalks in the kingdom and um i think this i don't know if it's his most recent book but three pieces of glass and it's basically your phone screen your television screen which i don't know how many people a lot of people do like whether it's video games or watch netflix you don't tend to do it on your your phone and then the third piece of glass is your windshield um and how suburbia and driving and vehicle centricity and stuff you're not walking on um, pedestrian scale human infrastructure much anymore where you are forced to uh, you know engage other people and, and put a smiling face on or recognize they're sad and ask if they're okay or help a lady across the street we're driving most of the time um, and we're on our phones when we're standing in line. At, you know, at, anyways, it's interesting. So, um, and he talks about third spaces and like, you know, in Cheers, going where everybody knows your name, right? That's not often the place anymore. Like, does the cashier that you know you've seen 10 times over at Aldi or at Kroger or wherever, like, do they know your name? But like, do you know their name? So um, it's a, it may, that could be a challenge, right? That could be one of the... Um, Forging on a challenge is just get to know the people that you regularly interact with, know their names. But um, I think that's that's probably what we're talking about. We're like pulling out of the discussion, like rec league basketball or whatever that brings you to a community center and to third spaces where it's like, or the gym or something, or like CrossFit. People, you know, that's their third space. They'll tell you it's their third space if we're CrossFit guys. But, oh, they will. Yes. They always but will. I, I think aside, those are huge, though. That, those are a lot of people's, as they'd say, I'm at the gym. It's home office gym. So um, understanding, though, that um, the places where you rub shoulders with people matters. And um, we make decisions to build that kind of infrastructure. It's They don't just exist, right? Like we people build it and people design it and people um, invest in the places around us. And I'm saying... Christians ought to have more of an influential um, hand in that market where we're shaping places for people. That's really good. Um, I, I, I can say with certainty, and maybe I shouldn't be proud of this, but uh, every employee at my local pub knows my name and I know all their names. <laughs> nice. So I'm, I'm just going to put that out there. I've got, I've got at least one of my third spaces down. Um, we are getting close to the end of our time. So Banjo, final questions. 
Uh, well, I, I, I've got two. Uh, one is, uh, Connor, where, where can people go if they want to uh, learn more uh, about what you do and, and uh, what you've got going on and, and some of these ideas of you know, redemptive localism? And then two, my second question is, in, in the spirit of conversation, what's a question that you wish people would ask you more often in conversation? What's a question you, you wish you would get asked that you're never asked? Oh, those are good questions. Well, the first one's easy. Um, I'm most active on Instagram, which is the handle is Ecclesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A dot design. And um, that has links to website and websites being, you know, built out and things are, there's a lot in the works for um, the business. It's something that hasn't gone full time. I'm fully employed otherwise. So it is a side thing for sure. And it's more of a ministry at this point, but being able to um, have a few clients and, and operate it in, as, a, as a launching business is something that is a goal of mine. Um, so anyone who is interested, I would absolutely love to work with you, have that conversation and um, start a conversation. So reach out that way, uh, either on the website, Ecclesia's, ecclesiadesign.com or on Instagram. Um, and then in reaching out or in uh, having conversations in general, that's a good one. I don't know that I've actually really considered if I was asked one thing ideally what would it be um i mean i love to talk about a lot of the topics that i've brought up already so i something to the effect of you know um how do we take dominion locally here i think that's what i'm ultimately trying to exhort my um, following or anyone who's within earshot the the people that god has entrusted to me uh to be able to have their ear and their attention I'm trying to exhort and equip, exhort people onto the work of thinking about how you take dominion locally. So I think something to the effect of that in the question form, how do I take dominion locally? I want to just have that conversation with people um, and encourage people to have that conversation with others around them. Um, and then equipping them, I think maybe on that front as well, I'll, I'll go with that structure. Um, I would love for people to ask like, so how do we do it uh, using your skill set? Like how how can you help me do it? Because then that flows directly into a business model of, of being able to equip them with maps or plans or designs or strategies or theological training or uh, books or content or recommendations, anything that I'm able to just contribute um, as a practical tool from a takeaway of a conversation is that's the equipping side. Good stuff. Well, thank you for coming on. JJ, you got any last queries? You've, you've sort of answered my final question. Um, my, I always have one question I ask every, every guest that we have on my one final question. So you, you're feel free to add on to what you've said already. But the one question is always, uh, if there's one thing, one practical thing that you could give as advice to a young man, um, who is seeking to improve in this case, in their conversations and to grow their community better, uh, what is that one practical thing that you would tell them? Oh, that's good. I also, as a sidebar, my wife is frustrated to no end because of my inability to zero in on the one thing kind of question. Or what's your favorite movie? I always break it into right, categories. Right. Oh, so this is this is so going against my nature to pick one thing. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm I'm assuming it's a Christian man that I'm speaking to based on the listenership. So I would our, say our target you know, audience, young Christian man little, trying to grow. Yeah. Uh, so obviously like, you know, fear the Lord, study scripture, but I would maybe practically um, just identify the, the characteristic of like what it means to have a vocabulary. And it's something that most people don't understand um, the benefit of, but being able to speak to all people at all places, but like Paul said, becoming all people at all places, that helps to be able to have conversation, to be able to be persuasive with your rhetoric, with wordings and language that uh, you're, your conversation partner is able to understand, but your vocabulary, I would just practically point out, um, you have a speaking vocabulary, a written vocabulary, and a reading vocabulary, and they all mutually, kind of like truth, beauty, and goodness, you exclude one uh, to the detriment of the others. So if you're not reading and getting familiar with the great conversations of characters and just how people interact with ideally scripted, like this, these are these are narratives and conversations that are written and you can see how people can communicate. Um, then you're not going to be able to speak or write very well the same way. If you're not writing, um, 
it's something that you, you're not probably going to be able to understand. You get the point. So they all inter, interweave, and I think um, all of those contribute to your speaking. So um, the more that you're actively writing and putting thoughts into an articulated form and going through that exercise, the more that you're reading and ingesting and consuming, I think the better you're going to be able to verbalize your thought. And I've, just as a sidebar, the same goes for design. So being able to read the place around you and see the um, what you like about a place, what you think is it didn't work, or the details, um, being able to read and critique the place that you're in helps inform the way that you're able to design with a pen and ink and paper and, and softwares to be able to draft and, and create um, places that are buildable. Um, so that's your reading, that's your writing, and then being able to present your design and speak to its benefits and its um, to be able to persuade a client to build something. That's your, your verbal design vocabulary. So um, I've noticed in my skill set that all three of those elevate the professional realm, and I think that translates as a as across different industries and um, different skill sets as well. But yeah, those are three practicals. That's awesome. That's really good. Um, I, I, I was thinking we should have called uh titled this episode instead of designing conversation, redeeming conversation. That seems to be kind of the big takeaway here. This has been really good. Thank you so much for coming on Connor. Thank you all so much. Blessings to you both. We've been talking to Connor Neville uh, about our current challenge and about community building. As a reminder, our current challenge is have an intentional conversation for 20 minutes or longer, best accompanied by a meal or a shared beverage or other activity. Uh, and we've we've specified in person and generally with, a, with another man. Uh, so we've been talking about that. Um, we'll have one more episode on this topic. We'll have a wrap up episode in two weeks from now. And we look forward to seeing all y'all then. This has been the Forging Honor Podcast. Music and production is by Elliot George. For more information about what we do or to learn how to get involved, visit our website at forginghonor.com. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to like, subscribe, and give us a rating to bring others into the Forging Honor journey. On our website, you'll find information on how to do the challenges alongside us, as well as links to the many resources we mentioned in the show. And we do make a small amount for many purchases you make through our website links, so thank you in advance. Thanks for taking the time with us today. We hope you'll take up the work alongside us and join us in the task of forging honor. We'll see you next time.